Okay, Dr. Richter, it's all yours. Very good. Thank you, Pete Flores. We want to thank Pete uh, today because we have changed uh, the system that we use for the webinars. And so this is our first webinar uh, using our new communications package to go out over the internet. So I want to thank you, Pete. And then I want to recognize Megan Clayton. Uh, Megan Clayton, our Extension Range Specialist in Corpus Christi, uh, she is the organizer of our webinars. And uh, be sure that if you think about a topic that through the years of these webinars that you don't see or that you think would be very beneficial to you, uh, be sure and let us know because we're always open to doing more of the things like we're doing but on other topics as well. And then uh, uh, I'm just excited that 37 of you have logged in today to, to be a part of the webinar. One thing that I do a lot of talking about across the state is I talk about plants and uh, one big group of plants we will call them weeds and the weeds when we look at them where do they fit within the ecology of our land uh, how do they respond to the management that we put on the land in the natural system how did weeds provide a biodiversity that was part of the normal functioning of the rangeland when we go back and think about rangeland does mid and short and tall grasslands with the chaparral and the high desert grasslands and the tundra and the riparian area in the floodplain, when and why did weeds come up? It, it is interesting to note that in the diaries of most of the naturalists that and passerbys that came to Texas in the 17th, 18th, and 19th century, none of them wrote in their diary that Texas had a weed problem. We, we would say today that the weed problem that we see across the state has come about as a sign of change in the era of time that we live. And so I wanted to, in, instead of giving a talk related to just the control of weeds, more of a talk on why do we have weeds and what do they mean to us when we have them. So I want to thank you for being here today. If you look across the state, many things are happening as I've depicted on this slide. Uh, there has been a rapid invasion of brush seedlings and saplings. There's brush on every fence line in the state. We have uh, in our society an increasing cost for conventional control methods and when we look at weeds they come up with every disturbance that's put out on the land whether that disturbance is from agriculture industry the private landowner or it is the people who are trying to take land that has been altered and changed and bring it back to something more natural at the same time we have a decreasing ranch ranch size uh, ranches are being divided up, they're being put in developments, uh, the urban zone is expanding in the state, uh, the people who are making the ranch size go down and the amount of urban encroachment go up, they have new expectations. They look at the land differently than we have looked at it where about 90 percent of the state was in agriculture at one time. So we have a change in land use across the generations of owners and managers that has an impact on, on what we do and what we will do in the future. When we go back and look at the best definition of management and, and how that relates to best management practices, if you reflect on what Drucker wrote in 1973, he described management as the art and science of making the correct decision. He, he did not say that seeding, unwanted plant control, prescribed burning, control of livestock numbers, the timing of grazing, building a new pond, putting in a new fence. He didn't say that any of those were management. 
he described those as the tools of management and what you had to be able to do is look at the land that you manage see what's happening on it try to understand why it was happening and then pick on a tool of management that we commonly talk about to try to rectify the problem that you're seeing well our brush and weed control practices uh, that have come along as best management tools they have included the chemicals the mechanical the biological and then our prescribed burning or even natural fire that still exists in the state today and so if we have all of these practices available and we do have government funding in many instances for landowners to be able to go out and conduct these practices to improve their property, their land, the health of the land, and even to make more money, then why do we have as much weed problems and brush problems as we see today? Aren't the weeds and the brush ever going to go away? Or are they going to be here until the end of time? So the next to last item I put on there is do all people need the same practices? Well, many times we are we are led by what we see in advertisements what we read and see in the new science of the day and uh, people will market ideas of practices and they will do that uh, through fluorescent or neon signs saying look at what we have it's the best in life it's better than X Y and Z and you need to be using our practice but we recognize that the practices that we pick to use in our land management they need to be directed at something that we associate with change whether it's positive or negative on the land and that that practice will make a difference in then how our land functions so practices they help us solve problems but we have to ask what caused the problem to begin with Many times, the practices that have been conducted on our landscape have been band-aids. It's been calling on the engineers with concrete and rebar to stop, stop the flow of a river or alter how much water comes down the river. But within the bailiwick of happenings with Mother Nature, usually what man puts out there can be altered, changed, or even destroyed. So when we look at weeds what causes the problem that we have with these plants as we go about our daily work on the land so we direct our attention to management that each landowner each homeowner each person in industry anyone that has land they're doing management and the thing that we want to do is select the right things to do from what we see happening on the land that there's not going to be a quick fix and there's not going to be a magic chemical or a magic grass that we can plant that's going to solve our problems that we see every day on the land so management it's selecting the right things to do so when you look and you think back what would be your vision of your land in the area that you live all uh, the majority of Texas 90 point seven percent of the state was labeled as rangeland land that the dominant uh, plant being produced was a member of the grass family and we have 560 different native grasses in the state and then we look at that land as you see in this picture with the bison the land has changed whether I'm on the coastal prairie I'm on the blackland prairie the Cross Timbers and Prairies, Edwards Plateau, the High Plains. Today we have brush and weeds. And would we be uh, scientifically sound to say that the number of weeds and the quantity that occur are basically today due to the historical management of the land by humans that came to settle in this great state? So I'll begin the discussion with that introduction on what is a weed everybody I talk to has a definition of what a weed is but look at this first definition up here that a weed 
is a, a, a plant that is simply growing out of place or growing in a site where it is not desired. Well, who determines that it's growing out of place? Who determines that it's not a desirable plant? See, in ecosystem science and management, the values about land and the earth ecosystem, they're placed there by humans. They're, they're there uh, and we, we set those values up ourselves. Oftentimes, the value that we'll place on something will be much different than the value of that organism in the natural system that existed before the European settlement of the state. In definition number two, uh, a weed may be a desirable plant in one location and a weed or unwanted plant in another. If you think about a man that plowed the Blackland Prairie and 99.5% of the Blackland Prairie was put into farming, if a man planted corn and the original native grasses that were there before he plowed the field came up in the field, he would call those plants unwanted, thus he'd be calling those a weed. Well, our, our native weeds, and, and this group that I'm talking about here, annuals predominantly, they serve a role of protecting the soil surface after a disturbance. And so you might have to think about what are the disturbances that occurred naturally on the land. The weeds are involved in reducing raindrop impact. And when I think about a raindrop coming down, a raindrop falls to the earth at 32 feet per second squared, and that's a lot of potential energy there. And if it hits bare ground, it throws soil up. If the soil falls back to the ground in moving water, we have erosion. And then the weeds affect solar radiation. On a day when the sun can hit the bare soil, on July the 2nd at 2.30 in the afternoon, we have demonstrations that show at one-fourth of an inch deep, at 2.30 in the afternoon, the soil temperature was 138 degrees. But when I went over and put the soil thermometer in a sod grass, the temperature was only 88 degrees. And when I put the soil thermometer in a bunch grass at one-fourth inch into the soil, the temperature was 78 degrees. And when I put that same soil thermometer in the soil underneath the litter that have accumulated under a group of trees, the soil temperature was a mere 72 degrees. Well, the air temperature that day was 98 degrees. And so the vegetation, including the weeds, can help modify the temperature of the upper part of the soil. And why is that important? Because if you've ever boiled eggs, and you put the eggs in a pot of water on the stove and you turn the heat up, ultimately when the water begins to boil, you see the water vapor coming out of the pot. Well, the sun does the same thing. If I have bare ground, the sun can bake the water out of our soil. And in some instances, from Kanza Prairie research, we know that by capillary action and a pressure gradient, as the water is evaporated on the surface of the soil, that pressure gradient will pull water up from lower in the soil, and the Kanza Prairie research shows that the water can be drawn up out of the soil as deep as 10 feet down. So when we have weeds, it may not be the plant we want, but the weeds interact with what the soil and what water in the soil is doing. At the same time, the root systems of even weeds like common broomweed, those add organic matter, organic carbon, back into the soil. Because our research under Dr. Zitzer, who's now in Arizona, and research by Dr. Blaisdell out of this department, they have shown that soil organic carbon on many of the grasslands of Texas are at about half of what they were historically before any of these rangelands were plowed and put into farming. So as I look around in Brazos County, farmed land 
that was common after the war between the states and up until about World War II, those lands have now become planted back to grass, and after a hundred years of plowing, we expect that soil to do something. Well, the minute I disturbed that soil in plowing, I generated a weed crop. And as I go back and get out of farming and put it back into a rest period away from the plowing, the first things that come up are weeds. So in definition four, we see that a weed is usually a plant whose virtue has yet to be discovered. Because in general context, we look at the unwanted plants, we give them a bad name, and we call them bad. And yet at the time that we see them, they are actually telling us a story about the change in the land. The weeds are a part of a storybook that tells us about the success of our past management. And with the weeds present, they give us ideas toward how we should change what we're doing if we don't want to perpetuate those weeds. So, on these rangelands that we have in Texas, the natural processes that were occurring at the time of settlement is we had primary and secondary succession, we had the weather, the rain, the wind, the evaporation, transpiration, water infiltration, varying temperatures, we had the water and nutrient cycles, the nutrient cycles including nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium, uh, carbon, and other elements. Then we had decomposition, the breakdown of organic matter on top of the soil and down in the soil that generated byproducts, final products, like combustion of carbon dioxide and water vapor. At the same time, Texas had a natural fire regime, and we had natural disturbances from the heating and the cooling with the seasons to the hurricanes, the tornadoes, uh, the change in the seasons. All these things were leading to a disturbance, and we had the bison grazing. Uh, we might imagine that the early settlers wrote in their diaries that one day they encountered a large bison herd in southeast Texas. The herd had about three million animals in it. They had to camp and wait for the animals to go by. Uh, they had to camp there for about three weeks. And so what do you think the ground looked like after the bison left the area? Well, when we look at satellite images today, you can see no place where the bison herds of historical times grazed in southeast Texas. All that land has come back, and generally that's through the natural process of secondary succession. On the land, we have birth and death. We have aging of all the living organisms. We have migration. We have the ducks and the geese and the butterflies that are in Canada that come down and overwinter in Texas and down on the coast and into Mexico. Uh, photosynthesis is a natural process of capturing carbon dioxide using solar energy to convert it in the carbon dioxide into a carbohydrate structure that gives the mass that we see in the world of plants. And then we have genetic adaptation and change. How have the plants uh, and animals survive the test of time for the length of time that the earth has been here. And importantly, we have an interaction with animals. The plant community also is eaten on by the herbivores, and then we have predators that eat the animals that ate the vegetation. So we have a predation and herbivory uh, activity going on on the land, and sometimes those can be labeled as disturbance. And then finally, the seasons of the year, which we are not able to control, we cannot snap our finger and make summer turn into winter just because we want it to. Well, this great system of all the 90.7% of the land in Texas being rangeland, it was driven by the disturbances that occur. One of the great disturbances in the state that happens is drought. 
And so drought, how do you feel about it? Well, we know drought is normal, and it had been occurring in Texas long before the European settlers moved here. So some kind of disturbance helped drive the changes that were on the land. When we reflect on this and go back to the seven basic principles of ecology, and these are not great big scientific findings, these principles are common sense. Look at principle number four, and uh, this principle uh, shows that humans have found that nature adhors a void and provides plants through the processes of primary and secondary succession to fill the openness. That means when we produce bare ground, Mother Nature has a group of plants that can come up on disturbed bare ground and give it cover because then that interrelates to sunlight, it interrelates to the water cycle, it interrelates to the amount of carbon that we're going to be ultimately storing in the soil. So that principle, Mother Nature, we give her that credit that she does not like open bare soil. So from this we can have a conclusion. That conclusion number one is that plants such as weeds were a part of the natural system and they came up in response to natural disturbances. And this is important to understand that the weeds that we have that are native are not bad plants but that they are telling us a story about the change in the land. So look at the Atwater Prairie Chicken uh, down in Bell and and down by Belleville in Austin and Colorado County was the original population of these birds dependent on the production of weeds and so their booming ground where they went in and mated that booming ground was produced to to produce short grass that was done by herbivory predominantly by the grazing animal of the era, the bison. But the birds, like the dove and the quail, they eat seeds. The turkey eats seeds. And so weeds were always a part of that system that put seed in the seed soil bank so that animals like birds could come in and have something to eat. Look at this picture on the Gulf Coast Prairie in Brazoria County taken in 1952. Where, where are the weeds out on this landscape at that time? We see that brush running live oak and, and live oak in general is coming up and that was partially due to the fact that about 1880 we tried to stop all the fires from burning because they burned up our house, our barn, they, they cornered our cows in, in a back pasture and the cows got burned and they died. Well, when we stopped fire, things started happening in Texas that have helped produce what we see today. What the settlers saw in 1823, the landscape of Texas partially reflected the fire frequency that was occurring in the state. And look at this picture in Chambers County uh, taken in 1952. There are no trees in the picture, there are no weeds in the picture, but that wetland, that wetland prairie was dominated by the same group of plants that dominated all the rangelands of Texas, and that is the grass family. So how do, how do we look at that? This is down in Colorado County, and this is a sea of little blue stem in this picture, but in the picture, Look at the couple of weeds that I have that are down inside of the grass. What kind of weeds, what kind of herbaceous plants lived on the prairie and could compete with grass for sunlight, nutrients, and water? Well, those are the perennial weeds. Basically, the annual weeds came up as Mother Nature's bailiwick of tools to recover the land from a disturbance but in our natural system, perennial plants, such as these weeds seen here in the picture, these were always present on the grassland. 
the grasslands of Texas had a variety of plants, had a variety of animals. Texas was known by 1854 worldwide as having a very diverse fauna and flora. But things change. We go up over to Rosenberg and we're on land that was farmed and then this land here in the picture has been released from farming. When it was released, what did it come back to? Well, the green down here in the foreground is ryegrass and rescue grass. Both of those are weedy species in our, in our system that we live in today, but they're not native plants, they're annual plants. Some of the bigger plants that you see back here are now noted to be Brazilian verbena, a perennial vervain that is native to Brazil, and it is now in this fence line here and out in the middle of the prairie. And so this land was farmed, but when it came back, it didn't come back to the plant species that were there naturally. It came back to a non-native group of plants that had been introduced. So change is occurring. Here on the south side of Granbury, outside on the outskirts of Lake Benbrook, look at this hillside of beautiful wildflowers. This is an area that's been protected as a native prairie and when I look at these wildflowers that are in here, the white ones are a larkspur, a delphinium, the purple ones mixed in here are the true Indian paintbrush, the, a lot of these yellow ones are the sundew plant, Enothera serulata, but ladies and gentlemen, they're all perennials. As a perennial, they have the ability to grow with grass and to live when disturbances are not taking place. The disturbance cycle generates the annuals. The perennials were there naturally. Well, to combat these changes that we see in the land, as managers, have we gotten into a pattern of thinking that concludes that we must control weeds every year? Now think about that. A lot of the people who planted their land to Bermuda grasses, Bahia grass, Dallas grass, through the way they manage it, they set it up to have a short grass coming into the fall with a lot of open, bare soil, and that is the location where annual weeds come up. Well, in our, in our group of tools, our methods of control of unwanted plants, we have chemicals, broadcast sprays, mechanical methods. We have biological control where we can use cattle as a biological control for eating grass or we, can have, we could have had sheep, we could have had goats that the only thing they, they eat more than just grass in their diet and then we have fire. So those are the tools that we've tried to combat the problem with whether it was needed or not. Well, let's look at what generated change uh, in that natural system that we would have called healthy at the time the settlers got here. Notice that these white areas coming into the post oak savanna and the blackland prairie and this upper part of the coastal prairie, this is an area that burned naturally every one to three years. The healthiest prairie up here, the climber prairie, north of Dallas and Fort Worth, it was in a natural fire regime of burning every one to three years, and so was the short grass prairie of the lower panhandle and then down into the Edwards Plateau. Notice that the rest of the area burned in four to six years. It burned in seven to 12 years. Even the East Texas Piney Woods was in a fire regime of seven to 12 years, and then all of the land in Texas burned at least within every 13 to 25 years. Well, that knocking out the fire had an impact on the kind of plants that we see today. So here in 1993, this picture is showing where Highway 6 is right down here to the bottom left corner. A man threw a cigarette out and lit the Johnson grass up. The fire rolled with the wind through the fence and went over the top of this hill. Now I want you to watch these plants on the edge of the top because 
Some people said, oh, look, we had a fire. The land was destroyed. But this happened on August the 3rd, 1993, and it burned up all the above ground material. But was it a devastating fire? After September rains, look what came back on that same prairie. Look at the trees in the tree line and note that right here, right here, right here, and right here is ash juniper. And after the burn, because these are non-fire tolerant plants, they did not come back. But notice that the natural grass did come back. And so this is in um, October. Uh, after the fire, uh, early November, but it was after we received the normal kind of fall rain. So, if you looked on the ground, look at the number of weeds, the little seedlings, the things that are going to be in a rosette form all winter, that are going to flower in the spring, and then they're going to die in the early summer. Uh, their carbon structure is going to blow away. But as they came up, how many are there? We've commonly said uh, in some, from some of our demonstration work that if I have six weeds or more of unwanted species per square foot, that would warrant doing weed control. But what you see right here in the month of November, is this a weed problem? Notice that the Texas grama, the common curly mesquite, the buffalo grass, and the native grasses of that prairie are growing. Well, let's come back next spring in March. Mother Na Nature's bailiwick of annuals have come up. The yellow or Lenheimer daisy and bladder pod, the bluish white here that you see are Texas blue bonnets. And so the yucca over here survived the fire. These cedars up here are still going to be dead. But look at the number of annual plants that came up to protect the soil. Now, Let's come back in May and see that the blue bonnets have cycled out, but the pink and evening showy primrose and the Indian blanket and then Texas thistle down here in the bottom of the picture, these annuals that germinated in the fall are now going to flower and they're doing their thing on the landscape to help provide a cover to the soil. If I come back in June, I mean, well, this is still in May, but look at how the common curly mesquite and the buffalo grass here are doing very well after the fire, but competing with the weeds that they're in association with. If I come back in June, that prairie turned to horse mint. The horse mint came up. It goes to flower as an annual plant. It dies, but it sets seed so that the next time the land becomes uncovered, it can come up once again. So we see these kind of plants dominating the landscape after a disturbance. If I come back in August, the green in the picture here, and then this line right back here, this is common broomweed or annual broomweed. It actually germinated in the months of September, October, and November, and it has come up and it's getting ready to go to flower in late August and September. So the land is constantly changing. And then this picture, you can see the broomweed had gone to flower, but this picture was taken 16 months after that wildfire. It basically looks now, 16 months later, like it did before the fire took place. So those annual plants, they came in to provide cover. Well, let's look at another scenario, another cause of openness. This, is, this picture is in Washington County. And there's an old adage that says that that pasture is lizard licked. The leaves are so short that even a lizard can't get their tongue around it to take a bite. So here, I'm going to be producing openness between every grass plant and this pasture. And as I come into the fall and go to next spring, this pasture will become dominated by annual weeds. So this example outside of Bonham, there's a fence in the middle here separating two equal pieces of property. Look at the weeds that are here on the left, including snow on the prairie and a lot of common broomweed, palmer amaranth, and even western ragweed in the picture. 
this side, the left side, was grazed with one goat per acre for 90 days in the months of March, April, and May. At the same time, the picture on the right, growing a lot more grass and fewer weeds, it was grazed with goats for 90 days in the month of March, April, and May. And so look at the browse line. The goats it turned into the pasture, produced a browse line in about 30 days, and then they had to turn their attention to eating grass and the weeds that were in the pasture. Well, in a biological control sense, they reduced the population of the weeds, letting the natural resources of water and the nutrients there go to production of grass. So grazing can produce the openness that produces weeds. Yes. Dr. Rector? Uh, yes, sir. It seems like some folks lost uh, the, the pictures. They can't see the picture. Let's give, give me a minute to see. Yeah, okay. Uh, uh, if you, if y'all can see, I don't know if it's uh, computer specific or not, if, if you all can still see the the impact of drought uh, graphic on the screen, just give me a check mark up there on top. Well, one thing I did, Pete, is I turned the pointer off. Okay, it looks like things are, looks like everybody looks has an okay. It might be a computer specific. It, seems like uh, it could be the pointer. Things. When I turned the pointer on, it may have done something to... The projection of the picture. Okay, no. okay. It looked well, like we we're still good. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Well, in this picture taken in Kendall County, look at the impact of 10 years worth of drought. Not that it didn't rain, it just never rained enough. And so here, the grass in a drought, one thing that happens is the growth of grass does not exceed decomposition. So even on vacated land that is not being grazed, Grass can disappear through above ground decomposition and over a year or two give an open uh, look to the land with very little grass on. It doesn't have to be just livestock grazing or mowing. Well, in that bare ground, look at this set of weeds that have come up in this picture. These are all these bluish green weeds that you see here, these seedlings and rosettes. These are bladder pod, uh, a lescarella, and the cruciferae and they're related to the mustard group. So the openness, we've now got a crop of weeds. Well, if I'd had grass, I might not have gotten that many weeds, but drought can be a natural um, cause of openness and thus weeds. The problem that we end up with, if you see uh, in the picture here, there is a litter dam, and when I don't have the good grass cover and I'm growing the weeds, uh, when I get movement of water across the landscape, the dry matter, the litter of the land can pile up and create a little dam. And that identifies for me that I have overland flow of water. But at the same time, those bare areas are going to be producing weeds. Over in Milam County, here is an example of a weed control demonstration. And if you look in here, you can actually see the individual plots the plots that don't have weeds were successful. The, the, the area like down here in the lower left, very few weeds, that chemical application gave a control to a lot of weeds. Well, what, what is our goal? The guy trying to grow grass, he may not want any weeds in his crop, and he's going to be using a procedure to get rid of all the weeds. But look, this is in Falls County, and look at the diversity of plants that are here. But is this a good diversity when I look that a lot of these green plants right here, that these are cockleburr, a common introduced weed. And some of these other plants, like right here in the bottom, that is broadleaf sumpweed and iva. So have I really achieved diversity with ratama, uh, an invading woody plant, and a series of weeds that are both native and introduced? So I have to think about that diversity. So commonly, this is the challenge we have, is to get rid of the things that are here on the right so that I can grow grass that you see on the left. Well, a lot of things happen. Look in, in this picture, the bare ground in the foreground is where a guy uh, put out his hay bales, his round bales, every year for about 10 years. When he quit feeding on the site, 
the grass that had been growing there had been killed from the lack of light because of a stacking of the hay, uneaten hay on the ground. But what came back was a series of weeds. And right here on the far left and in the center, this is cockleburr. But down here in the middle right, that is buffalo burr. And a lot of these plants with the taller stems are palmer and maranth. We would call all those weeds, but they have come up because the seed of those plants was already in the soil. So when the openness occurred, annuals such as these came up. Look at this picture, an area that was plowed and reseeded. And the grayish green in the picture is one seed croton here, but I do have common broomweed and I do have cockleburr as, as other disturbance plants that have come up. In this picture, uh, the rancher went in and plowed the 40 acres here and he planted it to a native grass mixture, but because of the disturbance of plowing, annual sunflowers came up and they're out there looking at it, where's the grass? But because of the disturbance, weeds came up naturally. So we can conclude here in our conclusion number two that plants such as weeds respond to human management practices and changes in our local weather conditions. So uh, look at the cover in this picture. What do I go about to stop producing a weed environment? The grass that you see in this picture is about six inches deep and that you'll note in all the inner spaces of the grass that you see no weeds. But if I open that piece of land up to only 40% bare ground, look at the weeds that are now mixed in with the grass that may ultimately get taller than the grass and actually shade that grass out depending upon the weed species. Open that land up to 60% bare ground removing the cover of 60% of the grass, and then you will be growing a major crop of weeds. You'll have con converted what grew grass to, to a more diverse plant community of weeds. So in this demonstration conducted over in Bosque County, note that here in the uh, in February the 5th, when a burn was put in, we had about 10 annual plants from annual broomweed down to pellitory and vetch and thistles and we had 278 plants per square meter. When we came back after the April the, on April the 3rd after the burn put on this land on February the 5th the annuals were pretty much wiped out of the system for that year and the perennials who were barely there at the time of the burn, they became the dominant species on the land. So did I really get rid of the weeds? It depends on how I look at this difference between annuals and perennials and my goal of the landscape. But even my burning may allow some plants to come up. So in the life cycle of, of our weeds, let's look at winter weeds, the ones that come up in the fall, in September, October, November, that's when they germinate. And because we do not have permafrost soil, but we have warm soils all winter, even when it gets to 10 degrees, they, these plants live in a rosette stage. Uh, as we get warm and come into late February, March, and April, these plants go to stem elongation, then they go to flower in April, May, June, and July, and then in the middle of the summer, most of them have died, they've done their thing, they produce seed, and they only come back from these seed that are produced for the next year's crop. So the strategy of survival for an annual weed is to produce an abundance of seed and keep the soil seed bank full of seed for you to end up making a mistake and opening up the land to bare ground. And so we drive that weed system. Now note in this picture, this is gray gold aster, uh, a common perennial sunflower, but look at the size of the root. These plants are there all the time because they live for tens of years. They will remain in the plant community unless I do something to get rid of them. Well, here's a 1952 picture. It has grass, but look at all the weeds that are in it as this herd of Hereford cattle are grazing this part of the post oak savanna. 
where the Hilton Hotel is today in College Station, this picture shows what the land looked like. The trees are post oaks and willows and mesquite, but all of the green weeds in the foreground and in the middle of the picture, those are western ragweed. That's the situation that that land was in at the time that the Hilton was going to be built and the land was bulldozed. Now, look at this prairie called the Hopman Prairie down by Brenham. Its management was different. It was a native grass stand, and the native grass was only cut and baled in the month of July one time of year. Because in July, when I open up some of the soil to full sunlight and I have moisture, the seeds are not going to germinate. They're either going to germinate in the spring for, sp for summer weeds, or they're going to germinate in the fall for winter weeds. So this pasture did not have to have any weed control from how it was managed. Well, along the way, I have to think about how my plants interface with my native wildlife, because many of these plants that we'll call weeds, in reality, they were feeding native wildlife. And look at this fawn. Here's a situation where the fawn, we went up and kicked that fawn, but it didn't get up. It said, my mother put me here. You can't see me. I am hidden. But it was in a crop of weeds from western ragweed to the blue vervain and other weeds that you see in that picture. So sometimes weeds also can be cover for wildlife. And then what about the Rio Grande in the eastern turkey? A lot of times we find a clutch of eggs, as in this picture, where the weeds have provided a habitat for nesting for that turkey to get away from predators and not be seen by the predator and lay her clutch of eggs there. Not all the eggs are always laid in grass, but they may be laid where there's a protection from a predator. Well, look at this picture of bull nettle. On sandy soils, it's, it's a common weed that people think is bad. But when these white flowers go to a seed pod, in that seed pod, because this is a member of the Spurge family, three great big seed are eaten. Even though the, the turkey eat it, it is noted that humans ate the seed of this plant because they're not poisonous, and the seed tasted like a chestnut. Look at this weed called the bull thistle. But the Circium herigulum here produces from 300 to 600 seed, and birds actually lie on that flower head and eat the seed right out of the top of the plant. And then what about bloodweed and all the ragweeds? This is a wonderful sunflower that the seed produced up in these disc flowers. It has no ray petals. The seed are noted of the ragweeds to be in the top 10 foods of dove and quail. Well, the ragweeds are noted weeds if I'm trying to grow grass. So there's a balance here. When the man goes in to get a loan, he said in this, he said, sir, you're only out of patience. I'm out of grass, out of feed, out of water, and out of money. Is, is that the way we look at the management of our land and that we want a cure to get there? In this Ace Reed cartoon with the livestock business, note that these two body condition score two cows are eating the last grass in the pasture out of the nursery that has been produced by the prickly pear. Now they're getting thorns in their mouth, thorns in their nose and face, but their goal is to eat grass. Well, this landowner just didn't produce the food that grew that cow. Well, the changes that have occurred. The industry of the state has caused changes. Our farming of our lands has caused changes. And if you look down here, this satellite image shows that man's own infrastructure of pipelines, TV cables, roads, fences, changes the land, and that in many instances today, recreation is the number one use of the land. But in every one of those situations, we have produced a very good crop of weeds. So look at this plant in the middle of the picture. From what you see, and that's what it looks like right now in February, is it a weed? And can you name the plant? And look, here it is when it's gone to flower. And we find that this plant, Engelman daisy, 
is an excellent wildlife food. It's an excellent cow food, sheep and goat food, and it's also planted by the highway department since 1936 on the roadsides of Texas. But in this growth form, would you know that it wasn't a weed? See, I've got to be able to name the plants before I can go do something about them. Well, the rangelands of Texas changed, starting with the introduction of livestock into the country, and it doesn't look today like it did when the bison grazed the prairie. The early settlers in the area said the grass was stirrup high or belly high to a horse. The only thing we've ascertained from that is people used to have horses with shorter legs, and now we grow short grass. But look at the Dorothea Leonhart Prairie, a 200-acre prairie managed by the Nature Conservancy because there was no herbivory, no grazing of the grass. Over time, the grass became decadent and started growing on itself, shading out the point where sunlight got to new leaves, and weeds started to show up, as you see down in the draw and woody plants began to encroach. Well, as part of that system, we brought fire back into that Dorothea Leonhart Prairie in 1985. And it was basically there, not to burn up the grass, but it was brought in to control the unwanted plants that were coming into that system. So, another plant. Look at this one in the center of, of the picture. This little rosette right here with spoon-shaped leaves. Do you know the name of it? Well, it's January. You don't know what you're going to do about the weeds in spring. You're out looking, and you encounter that plant. Do you want it or not? Well, let's, you say you don't know the name of it. Well, let's look at it in April. Now it's a great big plant with water-sucking leaves, and then you don't know it there. No flowers, because all the wildflower books only show color pictures of the flowers. Here it is in August, and this whole pasture is turned into that plant, and it's gone through stem elongation, change of leaves. But what is the plant? Hadn't it been using up all the water? Didn't it intercept the sunlight and keep the grass from growing? And then here's the plant in September in flower. Here it is in October, uh, over in Palapinto County, and note that it's common or annual broomweed. Well, from understanding that it's an annual, I would know that the environmentally sound and safe for the environment and the cheapest method would have been to spray this plant back in the month of March. And here, look at the plants. They're now flowering. And if a quail eats 43 grams of seeds a day, and each one of these yellow masses produces from 15 to 40 seed, I think we got more seed for quail than they'll ever eat in the time that quail are going to be here in Texas. So the land changed. And many times, due to the name of a plant, I can be confused. This plant with the round top branching above the middle, that is common broomweed, and yet to the right, is its sister, Texas broomweed. One thing, and it branches below the middle, and it has an uneven top, but both produce seed for birds. But note, the common broomweed only germinates in the fall. This Texas broomweed germinates in both the fall and the spring. So early spring management to get rid of this species this one germinates after that practice is done, and people think that the chemical or their management method, like with fire, did not work. So conclusion number three, if you look at a plant such as a weed and you cannot name it, this may affect the results of your management. Getting here to the end, I want you to look at this picture of a coastal Bermuda grass field on the left and note that the native grass that was there before this was farmed is the little blue stem you see in the picture. How would you feel if what you planted was being replaced by something else? And what if it was the original plant community that was trying to come back? See, we call that secondary succession. 
if the man slows down on his management of weed control, fertility, and managing that Bermuda grass for its above ground growth, over time he will ultimately lose his pasture to what was there originally. And so here on the right we see the same thing, but it's other plants, not just the grass. So we're, we're looking that conclusion for most management practices that we do affect plant succession and alter the plant community. Well, ladies and gentlemen, that is where the weeds fit in and what has created the problem that we see in our era of time. We have only labeled the plants as bad, but they have a place that they fit within the system. And I see, Pete, that we have a few questions and and I will go back and and, and uh, see what questions we'd like to bring up or if you would like to ask a question now because we have four minutes remaining in the webinar so here here's one question uh, from uh, Becca Sue Dr. Barrett, Dr. Rector Barrett. yes 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 uh, Wale, uh, Wale, Wale, will you answer the question I'm gonna put a yes. poll out there yeah, yes. Let him answer that, and then you can answer the question as I answer the poll. You see how to see a poll that comes on the on the screen? Mm-hmm. Right. So we even have questions for you, the listeners, the participants in our program. All I have to do is type in type in the answer. Uh, don't worry about the spelling, and submit it, and we'll go from there. You want to answer the questions as they, as they do that? Yeah, uh, Becca Sue said, so is the definition of a weed restricted to turf plants? Well, I hope through the webinar that you've seen that on all of our land in the state of Texas, when we provide the correct kind of disturbance, we can get a series of weeds that come up. And uh, we want to thank you for putting in the plant that you think is your most important weed. Uh, Pete? We have another question for them as well. Okay, let me go ahead. I'm wearing this poll, and I'm gonna, I'm gonna ask the other one. Okay. And while that's coming up, uh, someone has asked, "What is transpiration?" Well, the transpiration is the production of water vapor that's given off through the stomata or the holes in the leaves of a plant while photosynthesis is taking place. The plants are transpiring or giving off water back into the atmosphere. The transpiration accounts for 47% of your annual rainfall. Where it goes in a year, it goes back into the atmosphere. And the process that puts it there is plant growth, transpiration. So, in, uh, Pete, did you want to explain this one? We're asking the question on your property, can you now see what is driving your weed population that you have? And, and, and of course, there's more answers, but we have listed, is overgrazing causing your continual weed problem? Is it the drought? Is it the lack of fire? Or is it a wildfire that keeps coming back over and over? Is it the plowing? and the opening up the land mechanically. And for some of you, it may be all of those above. Yes, uh, Dr. Rector. Mm -hmm. And so, in, in coming to an end here, uh, Becca Sue yeah, yeah. says, do you manage invasive trees similarly to invasive weeds? Well, I think I see for Dr. Clayton that we have a topic in this question for a future webinar. Uh, yes, sir. We have two different webinars coming up. One will be uh, very timely about mesquite management. I believe that's in two months. And then uh, later on this uh, early fall, we're going to have one on um, a West Texas plant and also Wesatch. So stay tuned for those. Our entire webinar series for 2014 will be published very soon. 
with summaries for each one so you can decide if that might be applicable for you. Yes, as uh, uh, Dr. Rector, thank you very much. As we kind of end in this this, uh, this webinar, uh, you should be getting uh, you should be getting a web link uh, with a questionnaire. Please fill out the questionnaire. Our next session uh, will be March the sixth. A weather forecast: What's the store about the, the John Mason gammon? And the other thing is, uh, please uh, follow us on Facebook on uh, www.facebook.com slash txrange. We have a new fan page, fan page there. It's really uh, getting popular, so uh, please follow us there. And then again, if we need any small resources, they can be found on the on agrilifebookstore.org. That'd be www.agrilifebookstore.org. You can find them there. So I'm going to go ahead and kick out this, uh, this web survey, and please uh, fill out the survey for us. Thank you all. I don't know if you have another question or not. Well, Pete, I saw several people.